today is language issues in dissertation writing and thesis writing. Style and your reader, there again. Um, you know, very often people think that when they're going to talk about language issues, it's all, oh dear, you know, we've got to get it right. We mustn't have errors. This, you know, what we're talking about today is not driven by looking for errors or looking to avoid errors. Obviously, we follow rules in language because language has structure. Um, and so it operates in regular ways. That's how we understand each other. But we're looking at how to write appropriately for our purpose and for our reader. Again, Brian has um, dealt with that. <laughs> Go back to that. So it's not a matter of witch hunting in your text for mistakes. It's a matter of thinking about what do we want to achieve? What are our purposes? How do we want to locate ourselves? And how can we make strategic choices of language in order to achieve what we want to achieve? OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, about writing as craft first. I keep on coming back to this. You like the metaphor of the of the um, the orchestra. I love the metaphor of a sort of a basket maker or a pot maker. You know, making something useful for purpose, fit for purpose, but with everything that goes into it, the crafting, the working on it. Okay, so we will look at what a number of different writers have said about about writing, just to inspire us. And then we'll look at aspects of academic style. I can't cover absolutely every aspect of, um, um, of style and language, but just to pick up on some really important, useful, I think, um, elements. And then we'll look again at reader-writer interaction in, in the text. I think we might be able to finish a little earlier today and I'm quite happy in the last half hour or something if you have your laptop and you've got your text with you I'm quite happy for, to talk to you about any particular issues you have in your writing. Is, is that okay as a compromise on me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you would like to discuss some of the issues that we've talked about with regard to your own writing, if you've brought something with you, you've got your laptop, you've got your memory stick, then we can, we can do that. Okay, so writing as craft. Um, this is a world famous economist who has published hugely. Have a look and see how he describes his composing process. And tell me if you don't think he's a craft person. <laughs> the degree of spontaneity for which he has been striving. It looks spontaneous. It looks as if it's flown from his mind onto the page. And that's what makes us feel daunted sometimes, because we, it's there, you know, we, we, we don't actually understand that all writers wrestle and struggle and draft and redraft and self-criticize and put things away and get things out again and look at them. We think that we're deficient because we do that. Um, so I think this is, a, this is a useful comment. And actually, even our own texts, we are reluctant to edit. Let me just say that as well. That once you put something down, you actually want to rush it to your supervisor immediately because now you've achieved a chapter, you've achieved a draft. And it's quite hard to put it aside and get it out again and be critical and work with it because after all there's something there. You've got something, you've captured something. So, you know, one needs to bear in mind that this process is always going to be important and your supervisor will be delighted if you go through some more of these drafts before you 
you take your chapter to him or her. Clark said very simply, good writing is revised writing. Just like that. And Murray talks about many, many, many revisions. And she makes the point that writing that is sketchy, incomplete, tentative, and downright wrong is an inevitable part of the research and learning process. None of us will escape that. It's part of the process. It's part of what, of what we do. And Stephen Krashen <laughs> pulls together all the <coughs> research by saying that the ability to write a good dissertation he actually uses essay, but dissertation I'm putting in here comes from two sources, massive amounts of reading. That's why I like this quotation, because we're talking about writing all the time. One mustn't forget how important reading is to the process as well. So massive amounts of reading, which is the way we acquire the special language of writing. And then careful writing with revision. It's the drafting and the redrafting, etc., which is how we acquire the set of strategies good writers use to clarify their thinking and come up with new ideas. Okay, Stephen King. Anybody read Stephen King's novels? Thrillers? He's written a wonderful book about writing as well. Um, and all right, he's talking mainly about writing novels, particularly his kind which are uh, really quite dark and horrific in many ways. But this is what he says, and I like his idea about your toolbox. You know, you take out the tools that you need because you're strategic. You make choices according to your purpose, according to your reader. So I like his notion of a toolbox. And then I can't talk about people talking about writing that I've mentioned Peter Elbow, um, <coughs> who a long time ago said writing is a way to end up thinking something you couldn't have started out thinking. <coughs> so this is why writing is so important. It's not the shiny thing that just happens. It's a whole process. And part of the process is developing your thinking. That is really important. So struggling with drafts, redrafting, it's all important, not just to get a nice product, written product at the end, but in order to develop your thinking. Um, yes. Sorry, uh, what, what does he mean? I mean, maybe his own example of the toolbox, what would that entail? Well, it's the sort of strategies that we're going to talk about this oh. afternoon, are like the tools that you can use. Okay. If you have understandings about it, I'm hoping that the sort of the little model that I use with how you position yourself as a writer, um, how do you uh, relate to your audience, is in itself a kind of a tool. It gives you a way of thinking about writing. So it's strategies, choices that you make, things that you know about writing that will help you to achieve your purposes. Okay. Well, that's my reading of it, anyway. Um, maybe you must get you must get him in a tweet or something and ask him <laughs> what he means. Okay, so we're talking about not Stephen King's kind of writing. We're talking about scholarly writing. So the focus there is the analyzing. We're developing arguments. It's subject specific, discipline specific type of writing. Very precise and reasoned language. That's what we're looking to develop. Evidence and argument are at the center of our writing. And we talked a lot about this last time. Referencing and citing are used to acknowledge others' ideas. So that's the kind of writing that um, we are looking at. Brian has dealt with this. <laughs> Thank you. Not very well. Not <laughs> but just to remind you again, because I'm hopefully locating everything <coughs> that I do in terms of this rhetorical model of writing. Um, and that's why I thought it was important to say up front that we're not talking about errors and avoiding errors in a negative way. What we're rather doing when we talk about language issues is what strategies do we need? What tools do we need out of our toolbox in order to achieve 
our purposes as a writer and our audience's purpose as, as our reader. Okay, so we're going to talk about achieving an academic style, bearing in mind everything that we've been saying about drafting and redrafting and becoming craftspeople with regards to our writing. These are some of the tools that we can use. The first thing to, to just um, establish is that everything we do in terms of our writing and the choices we make is grounded in the discourse of our field. Okay. So things may be a little bit different in our different fields. Um, that's one of the reasons why reading is so important, because you learn a lot of the discourse of your field through reading. Then what, the things that I'm going to focus on, I'm just going to look at what I've called here a vocabulary shift. It's actually Swales, John Swales' um, term, a vocabulary shift. Because in my experience of reading people's academic writing, I see that sometimes people feel that it's academic. I want to impress. I, I need to impress my reader. And sometimes they do it in ways that are inappropriate. Flowery language, convoluted sentences which don't sort of hang together and lose your reader completely. Not the way to impress your reader. And what I want to suggest to you is that there are a few... You okay there? There are a few um, pointers to what marks our style, our written style, as academic and formal. And it's not a huge flowery <coughs> vocabulary. Obviously, we must use the vocabulary of our field. But I'm talking about flowery <coughs> vocabulary, just where we say things in as complicated a way as possible because we think that sounds academic. And there are some academics who do write like that, um, I must say. But it's not, um, we hope, we, we would hope that they didn't. <laughs> Then I'm going to talk about what marks our writing as formal and rational argument. And just look at some of the tools that we have there and the choices that we can make in our writing. And then we'll just look at reader-writer interaction and how we achieve that in our texts. So we'll look at those three particular aspects. <coughs> And then we will look at some examples afterwards from, um, from an extract from a journal article to see some of these things um, as they play out or maybe don't play out. All right, so signals of formality. Here's one. In English, you get lots of what is called phrasal verbs, where you get a verb and an adverb, or a verb and a preposition, but it has one meaning. So something like, Makeup, you know, um, these, uh, this is made up of the following factors. All right, break down. I'm going to break down the topic into three divisions. Um, find out, which means one thing, it means discover. Now, instead of using those phrasal verbs, one very simple way to create a slightly more formal feel, more academic feel um, to the language that you choose is to use a single verb, like comprise, instead of make up. Ah, yes, just one little word about comprise. There seems to be a lot of confusion between comprise and consist of. Now, generally, consist of means the same as comprise. And actually, there's no expression comprise of. Okay. That might come as a shock to some people. <laughs> so if you want an of, if you, if you really want an of, it must be consist of. But if you don't want to use a phrasal verb, you use comprise. Just one and so. Okay. So instead of, I mean, you know, um, the, this chapter will break down the topic in these following ways. Divide the topic, deal 
you know, um, deal with the, you've got another phrasal verb. You have to play around with it, but one way of marking your style as being more formal is to tend to use these single word verbs. <coughs> and the reason why is that make and break and find, historically, come from Anglo-Saxon. English, the earliest version, the earliest sort of form that we know it. Whereas comprise, divide, discover, rather are borrowed into English from Latin. So they have a more formal feel to them. That's more Latin vocabulary. That's if you're interested in the history of the development of language. But that's the reason why it gives that sort of more formal sense. Sorry, we this chair. And there's one of the Alright, then avoid colloquialisms. You want to achieve a formal style, a lot, sort of, basically. The kind of language that we use quite happily, even in an academic context, in spoken language. Um, especially a lot. <laughs> People use a lot. A lot of the time. <laughs> and then, moreover, they spell it wrong. <laughs> so don't use a lot, and then you won't have any problems with spelling either. Okay. So just avoid colloquialisms, the sort of things that are very characteristic of spoken language. You see, we, we're not getting flowery. We're looking at very small little shifts in, in the, the, the words that we choose. Don't use contracted forms. I'm sure you all know that. No wasn'ts and isn'ts and doesn'ts. Um, and no run-on expressions. I've actually seen people hand me a which says something, 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 etc. And I'm thinking, but hang on, you are the researcher. Now you're making me, the reader, kind of add bits in. You're sort of assuming that I can just add to what you've said. So um, that's the problem there, of course and so forth, etc., is actually saying to the reader, well, you can supply the rest. But meanwhile, what you're trying to demonstrate to your reader is that you're able to be precise and informative and all the rest of it. Okay. Now, here's something else which, again, just tweaks <coughs> the style and makes it uh, a little bit more formal. So you see, not every sentence is going to be heavily formalized. You're going to just look for opportunities to make these sorts of choices that characterize um, academic style. So instead of did not yield any new results, if you use a more formal negative form, you yielded no new results. It's shorter, <coughs> it's more formal. Not much funding, rather use little funding. Not many cases, few cases. So it's more concise, and I think that's probably why it um, is used in, in more formal writing. Now here's one that, yeah, no direct questions. You do find in journal articles sometimes that people will use direct questions. It's very interesting, if you look at the style of academic writing, and then a particular kind of academic writing, which is textbook writing. Textbooks are characterized by a much more interactive style, including the use of direct questions. So to me, it seems, apart from your research questions, that's built into to what you have to do. You have to ask those questions. But just in terms of asking your reader questions, um, you know, what should follow from this question mark, and then on you go. That sort of rhetorical question, to me, seems very inappropriate in, in academic writing. You can use indirect questions, um, which sometimes people struggle a little bit with, because indirect questions are a type of statement. You know, in a question, you actually move your verb. So, it is hot is your statement. If you ask the question, you say, is it hot? And you move your verb to the front. Um, in an indirect question, you don't move the verbs. Um, you know, we will discuss how
how uh, language has developed over the past century. How language has developed. If it was a direct question, we'd say, how has language developed? And we'd move the word. Okay. So just in case you're wanting to ask indirect questions, just remember it's a type of statement. So you don't move the verbs. All right, then here's another, here's another way of marking your, your style as formal. Placing adverbs or transition words after an auxiliary verb or within a verb uh, cluster. So you could say, generally it is the case that. Slightly more formal is, it is generally the case that. So moving your adverb. Um, even transition words, like however. However, they are unable to achieve the, their purposes. They are, <coughs> however, unable to achieve their purposes. Very academic type of stuff that you would be um, indicating there. So using these kinds of formal choices, judiciously, is all you need. You don't need flowery language. <laughs> That's the point I'm trying to make, just suggesting some of these style features that you could use. Okay, please stop me at any point if you want to ask a question or make a comment. <laughs> All right, so we've talked a little bit about style and I think the main point there is be precise, be direct, be simple in the structures of your sentences and rather create the formal, there's a check here the formal um, style that you want to achieve through those kinds of um, strategies we talked about. Then, the next thing that we need to do is to indicate that we are conducting an academic rational argument. That's an important part of academic style. So we want the clear, succinct writing that I've been talking about, and the things overlap, as, as you can see. Something important is no emotive or subjective language. Um, now we do use the language of judgment in parts of our dissertation. In fact, it's sometimes quite important to use words like important, significant. Um, but there's a quite narrow little band of words that we can use. So incredible, obvious, surely. Those kinds of um, emotive, subjective language 